In part four of the special five-part series on the Monica Memo, I visit with Hughes Hubbard partner, Laura Perkins. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode, and I'm absolutely thrilled today to be back with Laura Perkins. We are here to talk about the Monaco Memo. First of all, say that quickly three times. But Laura, welcome back. Thank you very much for having me again. Appreciate it. Laura, I have wanted to talk with you about this memo since it came out because you are a former DOJ prosecutor, obviously now in private practice doing white collar defense at Hughes Hubbard. But you have a unique insight that many of us in the compliance profession who have never been on the either a prosecutor or criminal side of things don't have. So with that introduction, the first area I wanted to ask you about was a section entitled Foreign Prosecution of Individuals Responsible for Corporate Crime and ask you, how do you see the memo instructing prosecutors to evaluate that issue? And is it really a significant issue given the literally explosion of anti-corruption enforcement action across the globe? I think it is interesting that it was raised in this memo. I think it actually could be an issue in the in in future cases. Essentially, the memo is instructing prosecutors to take into account if there is a foreign prosecution of culpable individuals in connection with the investigation and whether or not they should, in essence, credit that investigation and not charge those individuals themselves. I think some of the factors they include in the memo, it suggests that there's a real possibility that even if there is an ongoing prosecution of individuals in another country, that the U.S. government will step in and charge those individuals anyway. So there is a potential that it could create conflict with some of our foreign part. Previously, there's been This isn't a new issue. Often there are other countries investigating related conduct and there are individuals that could be charged in country A or in the United States. And there's often a discussion among the prosecutors about which country essentially will charge those individuals. And there have been instances where the countries kind of split. I'll take these people, you take those people. But here, what prosecutors are being instructed to look at may change that that evaluation and those discussions because prosecutors are basically being told, look at the likelihood of success in the other country and look at whether or not as U.S. prosecutors, even if the other country is successful, will find any jail term or any fines or penalties to be. So it could lead to some piling on and some duplicative prosecutions depending on how prosecutors evaluate these factors. Or we've seen a series of FCPA and anti-corruption enforcement actions where the U.S. has worked with, as you said, its partners across the globe. Obviously, Brazil, serious fraud office in the United Kingdom, France, perhaps Israel and other countries. So it's clear there is not simply cooperation, but an ongoing dialogue between prosecutors in these countries. Could this subject be a part of that dialogue as well? Absolutely. And it already is. So I don't think that the adding of this to the memo will make it part of the dialogue. The discussion of individuals has been part of that dialogue for quite some time. So it won't add a new factor, but it will be slightly changed depending on how prosecutors interpret this guidance. Could this even be a something that's a response to the now Second Circuit ruling in the Hoskins case or other cases where it was clear there was some form of corruption, but the FCPA either didn't reach it or jurisdictionally U.S. prosecutors could not reach individuals who may have been involved or were alleged to have been involved in the corruption? I don't think that this is a response to that because the way I read this is it's essentially guiding prosecutors to charge more foreign individuals as opposed to less and to say that even if your foreign counterparts are investigating and are prosecuting those individuals, you as a U.S. prosecutor should consider doing that yourself if you don't think that the consequences will be severe enough overseas. If you don't think, it has always been a factor of if there's another country and you that could be interested in prosecuting these individuals and that country just doesn't have the political will or the ability to prosecute individuals, then the U.S. would at times step in for those reasons in part to ensure that culpable individuals were prosecuted. 
Here it's a little bit different because it's talking about if there is already an ongoing investigation, prosecutors are being directed to evaluate whether that prosecution is enough or whether the U.S. needs to step in as well and go after those individuals in addition to or possibly instead of a foreign counterpart. Laura, I'd like to now turn to the subject of self-disclosure and timeliness of disclosure. I felt the Monaco memo emphasized in very strong language, the desire from the department and for self-disclosure, but it added a new component of timeliness. I was wondering if what your thoughts were first on just the general discussion of self-disclosure and then see if we can maybe explore timeliness. What is timeliness? Is a prosecutorial version of timeliness the same as Tom Fox's version of timeliness? And what steps might a company try to engage in to show timeliness to the department? Sure. So addressing first just the discussion of self-disclosure generally, I think that this memo and Dag Monaco's comments underscore the department's desire for companies to self-report misconduct that they become aware of. It, It directs components that don't presently have guidance on self-reporting and the benefits of self-reporting to develop that guidance. So I think it will have a larger impact in certain areas than in others. So for example, in FCPA cases, there already exists guidance on the benefits of self-disclosure and what's expected for in connection with self-disclosure, cooperation, remediation. But now the entire, the department as a whole, so different U.S. attorney's offices and different components within the Department of Justice are being directed to establish their own guidance on self-reporting. So I think that will broaden the emphasis on self-reporting throughout the department and will have a bigger effect in some areas than others. With regard to your question on timeliness, what does that mean? Unclear, but it really will be left to the discretion of prosecutors to decide whether or not a company was timely in its disclosure, both of the criminal misconduct, which has essentially always been the case as to whether a self-report itself was timely. But now it's not just the self-report, but it's also the information that is being provided by a company throughout the course of its cooperation. The memo places a lot of emphasis on how that information needs to be shared in a timely fashion so that the department can move forward and investigate and better prosecute culpable individuals. The one of the themes I thought the Monica memo had was it was a mixture of both carrots and sticks and that it did force corporations to engage in certain behavior quicker, faster and perhaps better. But it also gave carrots. And one of the carrots was around the timeliness issue will now be part of the evaluation of whether a company has cooperated so that they could get potentially 25% discount under the FCPA corporate enforcement policy. I even see it perhaps going to the cooperation component or discount in the U.S. sentencing guide. And so if that is correct, that would seem to me to be a very good and big incentive for corporations to really engage in timely self-disclosure and ongoing timely reporting. Would that be a fair assessment in your opinion? So I think that a big consideration for prosecutors in determining what is that percentage that you get for cooperation, whether or not it's, and I think that if it's not a timely self-report, then you're not going to, the company's not going to get credit for self-reporting. So right there, you're already removing one of the very large carrots that the department is offering. And, but then it, it, the way that the way the memo is drafted is essentially that throughout a company's co it will continually be judged on the timeliness of its disclosures. So one of the things the memo addresses is if you find, if you as the company or counsel doing an investigation on behalf of a company, find a particularly damning piece of evidence against an individual that Essentially, your first thought should be, I need to share this with the department. That's, the, that's more open and more assertive than the department has been in the past about its expectations with regard to how a company proceeds with regard to sharing information during the course of an investigation. There hasn't been as much 
at least public statements by the department about its expectation that evidence and those facts be shared in a very timely, very rapid fashion with the department. I'd like to turn to the discussion around monitors. There was a very lengthy discussion around monitors that had three components. One was the department's or individual prosecutors' evaluations of monitors. Two was a selection of monitors. And three was oversight or review of monitors. I'd like to focus on that first part, which is the determination of whether a monitor is or was appropriate and its entitled factors to consider when evaluating whether a monitor is appropriate. The prior standard, if I can winnow it down to two, seemed to be, did you put a program in place and did you test it? We obviously had the Benchkowski memo, which laid out a series of factors as well. But here we had a, a much broader list, I think 10 factors, and the inclusion of factors that seemed to speak just towards what did you do about it, but how bad was it when it happened? And I was wondering what your thoughts were on how a prosecutor might look at the factors to consider. Yeah, I think completely agree with you that these are much broader factors than were previously used by prosecutors in determining whether a monitorship was appropriate. Like you said, previously prosecutors would look at what is the state of your compliance program right now at the time of resolution? And that really was the guiding principle as to whether a monitor was necessary or not. Not, It was not a focus on how serious was the misconduct that brought you before the department. That was looked at in connection with the assessment of what will the fine be, what will the penalty be, what will the form of the resolution be, so guilty plea, DPA, or NPA. Here, Under this memo, a lot of the considerations that that go into the form of a resolution and the fine are now being pushed into the monitorship determination as, and that that is a change. That that is, I think, a, a significant change as to how prosecutors are being asked to assess whether or not a monitor is appropriate. It's still, the guidance still does include whether or not a, the company has in place at the time an effective compliance, a demonstrably effective compliance program. So that piece is still there, but the department has shifted some of the other sort of more culpability or previously thought of as culpability type factors and is phrasing them in a way that that is used to say, okay, if this misconduct was so serious, then it shows perhaps a culture that hasn't changed. And so that could be important for us to understand in our monitorship determination. It's a different, a different analysis than prosecutors did previously. The other components on the monitorship, specifically how a monitor is selected, is that something that is new in your experience or is that something that was actually done perhaps informally, but as a part of a prosecutor's overall remit in these types of cases? So again, I think the difference will be primarily in components and divisions and units outside of the FCPA unit. The FCPA unit and had a very formalized process and the criminal division had formalized guidance on monitor selection that is very similar to what is laid out in the new Monaco. The difference will be primarily for other components that didn't have that guidance and now will follow a method and a process that is similar to what the criminal division previously followed. In the opening paragraphs of the memo, it really talks about how the memo was prepared, the process the DAG and her staff went through, the issues, and it talked about talking both internally but also with outside experts, with those from business, with others. Is that something you were a part of, having ongoing discussions in the what I call the sort of ebb and flow or the give and take of the department's dialogue with the private sector? I personally did not participate in any formal meetings to discuss, but have had a number of conversations with individuals at the department about now that I'm on the defense side, seeing sort of some of the challenges that companies face and some of the issues when I am talking to companies about whether to self-report or not, or whether or not to put in place certain measures in their compliance program and giving 
description to people at the department who are who may not be as familiar with working with companies on these issues of what the challenges are and what would be really helpful for them to see and hear from the department. And I know that Dag Monaco spoke in her speech about really wanting to be able to provide some transparency and being able to help companies and officers and legal officers at companies have something to show to the business executives to say, this is why you should be doing this. Here is some guidance from the Department of Justice as to the importance of, for example, policies related to ephemeral messaging and communications on personal devices, things like that. Having something from the department to be able to point to can be very helpful for companies and compliance officers at companies as they're trying to explain to business executives why certain measures are important. And that's really what I wanted to end this podcast with. Stepping back to perhaps a 30,000 foot view, I saw some significant and detailed guidance on a variety of topics in this memo, not simply transparency, but real guidance and information that compliance professionals, white collar defense lawyers and corporate ex- could put into place. So I was wondering if that would, what your thoughts were around just the communication of information from DAC Monaco in the Monaco memo. I think that the more communication from the department, the, help, the more helpful it is for companies to understand the department's expectations before they find themselves there. So to understand and to have a written document to be able to point to, to say, we need these policies or we need this resourcing, this will be evaluated and it will be a significant factor if we find ourselves in front of the department. I think that the compensation focus, executive compensation focus by Dag Monaco in the memo is very interesting because there, I'm sure there are a number of compliance executives and companies that will find this to be a challenging thing to figure out how do we legally structure clawbacks in these instances? How do we, how do we incentivize? What sort of bonuses can we give for compliance related topics? Those are difficult things to analyze, assess, and then decide on. So I think that again, having that sort of document to say it's important, this is a challenging issue for us, but it's an important issue and here's why. That openness and that transparency will be helpful for us. Laura, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time for this episode, but I wanted to thank you for taking the time to visit with me. This is a very significant memo for FCPA and other compliance professionals. And thanks again for helping us understand it. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, Tom. Always appreciate it. This is Tom Fox again. Thank you for listening to this episode. Hope you'll join me tomorrow for our fifth and final episode where I'm joined by my Radical Compliance co-host, Matt Kelly, and we take a look at the Polite speech interpreting and expanding on the Monica Memo.